Nice to see you all again. Hello. So, yeah, we have to explain how to secure the next internet in 17 minutes and 57 seconds. Are you up for that? I can do it. Okay. So, first of all, the whole idea of building the new internet, I think that was a plot line in HBO's Silicon Valley. What, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, it absolutely was a plot line in HBO's Silicon Valley. That was one of the reasons we picked it as our vision statement at Tailscale, because I, I enjoy being teased about this sort of thing. Um, but also because, well, it, you know, it, it elicits this sort of like, wow, what, that sounds big, but I don't know, I don't know what that means. Um, and what it means is, you know, back in 1994, uh, if you had a Windows computer and you wanted to, like, it was dial-up over modems, if you wanted to connect to the internet, you actually had to download third-party software that added TCP IP, the internet protocol, to your computer. In 1995, Windows 95 came out, and it came with TCP IP built in. And this was like a big thing. It was like one of the headline features. And now, like 2025, 30 years later, right, I have a smartwatch. And if your watch doesn't have internet, it's broken, right? It doesn't do anything. Like, what's, what's the point of a watch without internet? The internet is everywhere now. Um, but it's the same exact internet, the same TCP IP that we had in 1995, and pretty much the same one that they had in 1990 and 1985. Like, it hasn't changed almost at all. And things need to evolve. Like, the, in the way we use the internet has changed dramatically, and there's a lot of limitations to the old internet that have not been fixed. It was supposed to be fixed by IPv6. IPv6 never rolled out all the way. We didn't get the, we didn't get the solution. So Tailscale really is a product that is intended to move the internet forward. It's intended to solve some of the problems that have come up over the last like 40 years of the internet not changing. You reminded me that back in 1994, I needed to find a copy of Mac TCP to put in my power book for the, because of that same reason. Yep, trumpet windsock. That was, that oh, was my best friend. We're completely dating ourselves here. Uh -huh, yep. So in the AI context, it's, it, apparently lots of companies are deciding it's not enough to have just one AI. You need a multi-cloud approach. Why would you want to do that? What are the advantages, and how can you then get yourself into trouble with that approach? I mean, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble with AI, as uh, I imagine most, most of us know. Um, Multi-cloud with AI, one of the things that has caused that to come up so often is that GPUs are expensive and hard to get. Uh, and so the best price for a GPU is probably not at one of the big cloud providers like you would hope. It's probably at one of these upstart, new, third, like, sort of level three cloud providers that specialize in GPUs. But the best place to do everything except GPUs is still one of the big cloud providers. And now you have what is called the multi-cloud problem, where like GPUs are over here, the rest of your stuff is over here, and I need to connect those two things together. And if the internet worked the way the internet was supposed to do, what's the thing that the internet does that we all knew back in the 1990s that is like the, the axiom of the internet? I can connect anything to anything. That's the whole point, right? But you can't do that, right? Because they're both behind different firewalls, and you don't know the IP address, and the IP address probably changes, and like, how are they ever going to find each other, right? So. Tailscale turns out to be the, a thing that solves that problem, and that's how we got sort of pulled into the AI world. Um, but it, it's actually a really hard problem. The multi-cloud problem is, is hard to solve, and nobody wants to solve it because everyone working on AI would rather work on the AI part, right? And networking is just an obstacle to solving your problem. And, and you all got into business not originally orchestrating AI, but just mere software cloud resources, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the, the funny story is that mid last year, uh, we were doing some analytics and we found out that we had accidentally won the entire AI market uh, for networking software. E virtually every AI company was using Tailscale already. Uh, and we didn't have any mention of AI on our website. There was nothing about GPUs. There was nothing about LLMs. And, and you stayed in business stuff. nevertheless. Yeah, well, this is the story of my life. Uh, I, I blunder through life and get lucky a lot. Uh, and that was one of the situations in which we got really lucky. Uh, is that Tailscale solved this multi-cloud problem that everybody had, and the AI world has very, very, very fast, uh, tightly connected word-of-mouth networks. So when one person solved the problem, everybody copied them. Now, th there is a certain AI temptation. We were talking backstage. Lots of companies feel like they, they just need to have it somewhere. It has to be on the pitch deck. It has to be on their website. The investors want it. The boards want it. Are you seeing this lead companies to, to rush their AI adoption and set up multi-cloud arrangements that don't work well? Like, what are the, what are the worst uh, cases you've seen of those going sideways? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, 
everybody feels now, right now that they need to have an AI strategy, right? Even we, we went to our board of directors meetings you know, a year ago before we discovered that we had won the AI market, and our board would ask us, like, what's your AI strategy? And I would answer, like, look, nobody wants their network packets to be decided by an AI, right? Because the AI is like, it, AIs are great, and they're interesting, but they're not consistent. And the one thing you want out of your network is consistent performance, right? So I'm not going to plug AI in over there. I guess you could plug AI into the, like, look, there's flow logs. So you can want to analyze what people are doing. AIs are actually pretty good at looking at this like, massive information and summarizing, hey, something weird happened at this time on this day. Right? Or maybe you want something that like, writes your configuration and says that you can say, like, hey, I want to make it, make it so that you know, people who look like this or machines that look like this can talk to servers that look like that. Right? And so it can write the policy. But you don't want to put AI in the core of the product. So AI can be like, plugged in on top of what we do, but we don't necessarily do that stuff. Other people, when they're adopting AI, don't necessarily think it through all the way because they don't really know what the nature of an AI system is, right? And the nature of it is... They just know they need one somewhere. Yeah, exactly. The nature of AI is we spent like 60 years building this super neat technology that finally came to fruition like two or three years ago, right? And the new thing that we built is like 60 years of computer research that led to computers that for the first time are bad at math. Right? And that's actually, <laughs> that's actually an amazing achievement. We've never done that before. And the reason it's bad at math is because it doesn't understand math on that level. It understands something else on that level. And the something else is really cool, but very error prone. And you have to apply stuff like that very carefully, because you know, what else is really cool but very error prone, like humans? Right? It doesn't mean AI is human, but it means you have to manage it sort of like how you manage humans. And people don't think that. So you saw all these people are like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by laying off my team. And then I'm going to install AI, and it's going to replace my team. And like, that is definitely not how you should do it. Right? That is not how you would manage a human team. And it's going to have all the same mistakes when you do that. Now, when a company comes to you, hopefully before they make all these mistakes, and they they've actually have identified good use cases for AI, and they realize, you know, these are the cheapest GPUs we have right now. What are the questions you ask them? When, what does the process go like? A company that wants to use AI? Yeah, yeah. And, and have you helped them orchestrate it sensibly and manage it in a way that so, they don't wind up on the front page of, of the Globe and Mail, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, so the kinds of companies we end up talking to about this. So there's this new protocol. I don't know how many, well, maybe I can sort of see the audience. How many of us have heard of MCP? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Right. this is a great oh, audience. Okay. okay, good good room. <laughs> yeah, so model context protocol. It's, you know, long story short, it's a thing that lets AIs talk to APIs that are provided by, you know, traditional services. So now, instead of having, asking ChatGPT or whatever, like, hey, tell me what you know about such and such, and it knows or it doesn't know, it can actually query your servers, and you can say, like, what do you know about customer X when they were looking into something something, right? Or what do you, what do you think about the way people click when they go to this particular website, or whatever you want to use MCP to plug into. The problem with MCP, it's a pretty freshly released protocol. Uh, the people who invented it sort of said, well, this is great. As long as you figure out authentication and network connectivity, everything will be great. We don't need to solve that problem. It's not our fault. Uh, but, but then nobody solved that problem. And so what you actually get is people taking their APIs, putting them out on the public internet, sticking an MCP server in front so that an AI can connect to it. And this is, this is not a good idea, right? But it's the thing that everybody is doing because there is no better obvious way to do it. Uh, we actually had a situation about a month ago. I was at a conference, and someone booked a sales call with me. And they showed up. They're like, Avery, I have to apologize. This is a bit of a bait and switch. We already love Tailscale. <laughs> we already use your product. You don't have to sell me anything. I want to pitch you on a product you need to build. And and the product was like they were an AI company. And it was like, you need to make something so that it's the default thing to do for MCP is to use this little module and not expose your API server to the internet because you can use Tailscale instead. Because all these AI companies are already using Tailscale. They already know this thing is good. But all of their customers do not know that. right? And so we're working on that. There's a little bit of an open source project we've started. It exists. Now it's a matter of like sort of getting the word out there. OK. Now, what lessons have you drawn from your earlier work in helping companies integrate diverse cloud resources that, that are not in the AI sphere, which you first set out to business? How is that? What lessons did you take from that to taking on this space in AI? 
Yeah, it's, it's a lot of the same stuff. Like, actually, like, Tailscale is a networking company. It's kind of interesting because, like, the most basic networking use case is corporate VPN, right? And the corporate VPN market is about $80 billion a year, which we obviously are only getting, like, a tiny little bit of. And just like the internet, corporate VPNs have changed, like, almost not at all in the last 25 years. And if you ask somebody, like, how much do you love your corporate VPN, Mostly you get a I laugh. I know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> right? N nobody says, like, I love my corporate VPN. But we do get people running up to me in conferences, and it happened a couple times to me just today because I was wearing my Tailscale hoodie, and they were like, oh my god, I love Tailscale. Wow, this is so great. Right? Because Tailscale is a different thing that ha is newer than 25 years old. Right? So what we started with was just, like, people at companies need to connect, like, their employees to their resources. And it's the most common problem and everybody needs to connect things to other things. That's what the internet is for, and that's what the internet is sort of failing to do. Like, if you think about, I don't know, I left my laptop at home, I have my phone with me, I want to I download some photos that I left on my laptop. There's no, I guess I can't connect to my laptop. What's its IP address? Where is it? It's behind a firewall. I can't get there. If you have Tailscale installed on those two devices, you just download them from the App Store, you log in. After that, you can access stuff on those devices regardless of where you are on the internet. That's, that's a good size. I've, I've lived that exact issue. And uh, yeah, I think it, in a consumer context, it would be asking if my wife can unlock my, lap, my desktop and send me the file or whatever I'm missing. Exactly. And companies have the same problems as individuals have, right? They've got a server behind the firewall. And especially, you know, the difference between the world of five years ago when everyone was working in the office and the world post-COVID where a lot of people are not working in the office it's completely different, right? When you're not in the office, now you have a problem. I can't access any of the servers that the IT department set up for me unless I use this terrible VPN that everybody hates. Now, you've expressed a little bit of skepticism about, about AI as this, I've sometimes described it as this sort of condiment, like mayonnaise you have to put on everything. <laughs> to what extent do you use it internally? Are, are there applications you've thought, actually, this would make a, a useful contribution or cases where, say, a vendor has said, we'd like you to deploy this, and you said, no way? So first of all, I think I would describe AI as being in, in basically the early adopter phase. And everybody wishes it was not the early adopter phase, but it's the early adopter phase. And in the early adopter phase, like 99% of the stuff that you try doesn't make any sense and won't work. And then like 1% is going to make it to the mainstream eventually. And so Everybody wants to, well, you don't want to jump straight to, like, I believe that AI is the future, therefore I'm going to use it for everything. What you can do is jump to, like, well, I believe AI is going to be the future, therefore I should try it for some stuff in the spirit of trying it for stuff. And so at our company, AI is not, like, built into the product, but we do use some AI products with varying results, right? Like, I, I've used it to improve some slide headlines where, like, I have something that's kind of, like, long and, and rambly much like myself, and I say, like, chat GPD, can you make this shorter? And it, it, and it makes it shorter. And I'm like, well, yeah, but now that means something different. Can you make it shorter, but also use this word and this word? And then it does. And so fun stuff like that, that's harmless, because there's a human who's using a tool, and the human controls the output of the tool. Or we use, like, an AI code review tool. So people on our engineering team, and this is one that's experimental, we get, like, half, half good results and half bad results. But that's better than zero good results, right? So you, you upload a pull request. And then it comments on your pull request to see if it's like, does the coding style kind of match the rest of the product? Did you like, do things the way other people have done it in the past? The dream of the company we're working with is they're actually going to look, look through past code reviews and see, like, oh, when people have done it like this, they got a comment like that. That probably means this, and then fill it in. And there's like, some examples of that going on. So there's like, neat stuff happening. But you always, like right now, I'm, I'm very like, careful about stuff. As long as you have a human in the loop, if you're using it like a tool, that's a pretty good way to go. If you're using it to write code for you, that's probably a bad way to go. Is AI, in, in that context of reviewing code in pull requests, is it getting better at that over the last year? Absolutely. Yeah, there are companies. It's, and again, it's interesting because it's not actually, everybody is so obsessed with like the foundational models getting better, and that's going to solve all your problems. But like, Actually, it's what you wrap the foundation model in. Like The foundation model is like, it can look at stuff, but you have to give it the information in a useful format so that it can come to useful conclusions and tell you what those conclusions are, which, again, is a lot like a human. Like I'm a CEO now. Our company is 160 people. The job of many people at our company is to put information in a useful format so that I can read it 
and make a recommendation back to them. Because if the information isn't in a useful format, I can't fit it all into my brain at the same time. Something falls out, and I make a wrong decision. And it's exactly like how you can treat the AI. And so these code review companies are actually specializing in just like squishing the information into a format that's going to make the foundation model that exists today give you better answers. And they're actually succeeding at that, more or less through trial and error. Now, it looks like we have a pretty technically savvy <coughs> audience. I assume there are a decent number of startup founders or potential startup founders. Do you, do you want to offer any sort of bullet point advice to them about how they should be looking at using AI when the vendor comes to them with a sales pitch or the VC says, we like your, we like your deck, but there's not enough AI in it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, mean, I think the, the cold truth if you're a startup uh, is if you don't have enough AI in it, you're probably not going to get investors. Uh, Tailscale's been really lucky because our, our AI angle is like, eh, we're the, we sell the shovels uh, uh, to the gold rush. Right, which is which has actually worked out pretty well for us. But like everybody else is in a harder position. It's actually hard to get investment right now to a company that's not seriously AI. Uh, but that's you know that'll change. Um, but right now that seems to be the case, and I've heard that story many times. Um, so that means like you have to have an AI story of some kind. I would say. I mean the the best advice is like you can't treat it like a tool that is reliable. You can treat it as a tool that every now and then will come up with something great. And you then your job is to like filter out all the stuff that's not great and then present your end users with the parts that are great. And the companies that are successful are doing more or less that. And um, what is next on your roadmap for Tailscale? So Tailscale is kind of weird. We just did a big fundraise uh, a couple months ago, $160 million. And people are asking me, like, Avery, what, what's your next product? What are you going to do? That's so much money. Buy a private jet? Uh, yeah, buy a private jet. <laughs> actually, yeah, private jets are pretty affordable. You could actually get a rocket ship. Uh, for, Used for or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> reused. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we're probably not going to get a private jet. I still fly in economy class um, because I'm uh, that kind of person. Um, Keep it but, real. Yeah, tail scale, like weirdly, all we need to do, in my opinion, is just keep building the exact same thing we've been building and just make it better and better and more and more reliable and work in more and more situations. Lower power, lower memory, lower latency, more kinds of devices. Tailscale is ending up in a whole bunch of embedded devices built by companies that you've heard of that I'm not allowed to name because we don't have logo rights. Um, all of this stuff, it's going to look like basically exactly the same tail scale, but it's going to be in more and more places because for the same reason that the internet used to be in a few places and is now in my watch and my car and my microwave and everything else, right? Tail scale is going to go like that, and it might kind of look invisible to everybody else. And you might be amazed that we can spend $160 million doing that, uh, but it's going to be worth it. So that means a year from now, like, we can redo this, and you'll show how you have tail scale on your watch. I, I'm looking forward to it. My, my, sales, uh, my head of sales actually told me uh, he ran, ran into somebody running Kubernetes on their watch uh, a few months ago. That's just so showing if you can off. get Kubernetes on your watch, <laughs> you can definitely get tail scale on your watch. We can't end on a nerdier note than that. <laughs> Thank you That's very much. That's what I go for. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.